We have been looking through the Bible at the life of Joseph, the second youngest son of Jacob. He and his brother Benjamin, they were born to Rachel, uh, the wife of Jacob. Joseph was sold by his brothers to the Midianites, Ishmaelites, who then sold him <coughs> as a slave in Egypt. Potiphar, uh, the head of security, the head of police in Pharaoh's court, bought him and after some years, Pharaoh, he, um, Joseph found himself in a very uh, strange situation where the wife of Potiphar accused him of trying to rape her. Joseph, of course, is innocent but he is now in prison. And last week we saw how two other prisoners came, the baker and chief baker and butler from Pharaoh's court. Both of them had a dream and Joseph was able to interpret their dreams accurately. But as the butler was freed, Joseph said to him, remember me, but the butler forgot. Now two years have passed, Joseph is in the pit. So this prison is a very uh, undesirable place. It is below ground, underground, and you cannot see the light. He is chained, uh, he has chains in his, on his neck, and his hand and his feet. But Joseph never forgot who he is. And he never forgot God. And I assume, we have no reason to do otherwise, that Joseph spent a lot of time praying and meditating upon God. Just like many years later, the Apostle Paul, when he was in prison, spent a lot of time praying and seeking God. That's what you do when you are in trouble. Turned to God. Joseph turned to God. The Apostle Paul turned to God. And <clears throat> God did not let Joseph down. So things were about to change, and they were going to change very quickly when they started changing. However, there were two years that went by. So one day, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had a dream. He had a dream, a very strange dream, dream that shook him up and then he fell asleep and he had another dream. And he told his, his magicians and astrologers the dreams, but there was no one who could tell him what the dreams were all about. And then the chief cupbearer, the butler, then remembered, he said to Pharaoh, I, you know, I remember my offenses today when, you know, I was in the prison, there was a Hebrew, young Hebrew there, and he was able to interpret our dreams accurately, and as he said, I was freed and the baker was hanged. So, Joseph is called from the prison, and he comes and stands before Pharaoh, because he had to shave and all that, he had to get ready, dress himself properly, and he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells Joseph the dreams, and he just gives a little bit, a little more detail uh, in his dream. So Pharaoh in verse 15 said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. But Joseph says, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh the favorable answer. In my dream, I was standing on the banks of the Nile. So it's a very Egyptian dream. So you, Moses, who wrote this book, could not have made it up. It's not a story. It's something that really happened. And there is this uh, tablet that was recovered. It's called the, the Rosetta Stone. 
and it has the old Egyptian language in it, which they have been able to decipher. And in it is mentioned that the Egyptian pharaohs did celebrate their birthdays, like it says here in the previous chapter. So it's a real story, something that really happened. I had a dream, says Pharaoh. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the wheat grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin. So that's the detail that he gives, which, is, which are not there in the beginning of the chapter. And the, so there are these seven cows, very healthy cows, and after them came seven cows that were really very ugly and very thin. And the ugly and thin cows eat after the seven healthy cows. But after they have eaten such a meal, the seven ugly and thin cows are the same as they were. And that's a, if you have a dream like that, you definitely wake up and in cold sweat. However, then he had another dream. And this time he saw a, a grain that was growing up and <clears throat> and I also saw in my dream, verse 22, seven years growing on one stalk, cool and good, and seven years withered, thin and blighted by the east wind, just as if it would happen in Egypt, sprouted up to them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good years, and I told the magicians, and there was no one who could what a situation to be in man's interpretation. You see, in the world in which we live, there's a lot of fear. First of all, after two years of the coronavirus, there's been a lot of fear. In the first year of the coronavirus, we saw on our television screens how it was attacking people and many people were dying, gasping for air and and put on ventilators all over the world, and many, many people died. It's a lot of fear. And now there is new fear of a world war. Some people say it has already started. Israel is in danger. There is Turkey as well, making all kinds of threats. And then there is Russia as well, and then there is Ukraine. And there are lots of other things happening. It's a lot of fear. And people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they have no hope. It's like a dream. It's real, but it's like a bad dream that needs interpretation. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are the one person who understands what is going on and what it's all about. And you are the one person who has a hope you can interpret it and speak light into the situation because you know we don't need to despair and we're not despairing there's no need to despair as we were singing earlier on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand so if you're not standing on Christ then you're standing on another ground and that is sinking sand mm solid hope that you can share like Joseph did. And what a situation to be in. There was no one in Egypt who understood what Pharaoh had seen. But there is this one man who can interpret it. And listen to Joseph, and Joseph is, is quite amazing. You know, he had a gift that's actually quite rare. That if you had a dream, you went to Joseph and Joseph was immediately able to tell you exactly what that dream is and what it means. That's a gift. Just like the gift of eternal life. Just like the gift of understanding who Jesus is and what he, is, what he came to do and what has happened to him. Why did he die? And why did he rise again? Did he really rise again? And that he's coming again. And if you understand those things, God has given you a gift. He has opened your eyes, he has opened your heart, and he's opened your ears. You understand things that many, many people in the world do not understand. They 
there was a time when I didn't understand. I had heard these things, but I didn't understand. But one day, God opened my eyes. And I understood that Jesus died for me. He didn't just die for anyone or for everybody. He died for me because he loved me. He died for me to save me from my sins. Joseph is actually quite humble. That's one thing we learned about him. You know, he has a gift. No one in the world has this gift but Joseph. And Joseph could say, you know, he could have made a lot of money out of it. He could have become a celebrity. But listen to what Joseph does. Pharaoh says to him, I have heard of you and that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph immediately spoke and said to Pharaoh, it is not in me. I am not special. I am not a celebrity. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. It is God. Pharaoh, you, know, you need God. That's what Joseph is saying. You need to look at God. You need to believe in God. You need to trust in God. You need to turn to God through his son. God will give Pharaoh uh, a favorable answer. And the answer is quite amazing. The two dreams that Joseph had, uh, that Pharaoh had, they are the same. They're telling the same thing, that there is going to be seven years of plenty when there will be abundant grain followed by seven years of famine, and the famine will be so severe that people will forget that there was ever bread in the land. And the famine was going to spread, not just in Egypt, but all around the nations. And because Pharaoh had dreamed it twice, listen to Joseph's interpretation, and Joseph said in verse 25 to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Again and again, Joseph is bringing God into the situation. That God is in control. God is king. God is on the throne. God got the nations of this world in his hands. He's got the leaders in his hands. He's got the affairs of government in his hands. And God is doing something, and that's what the Bible is telling us, that God is doing something. He's got a purpose. He's got a plan, which is he's executing. And the plan has to do with you. If you are a believer and you know Jesus as your Savior, the plan is centered around you, around the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God is doing. It's about us. It's quite amazing. It's very humbling. That everything in the world that is happening has ultimately to do with me and you and what God is doing in our lives. And the dreams are one. And God has revealed it. And because it was given to you twice, then God has fixed it. The doubling, he says in verse 32, the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now the second thing that's quite amazing is that after Joseph was sold, he was, when he was sold, he was 17 years old. And when he came into the service of Pharaoh in this chapter, we are told that he was 30 years old. So that means that 13 years had passed as a slave and in the prison in the pit. A long time. That's 13 years is a long time of having lost everything. He lost his family, he lost his freedom, he's now a slave, and then he's now cheated, and then he's abused, he's, he's got a, you know, a rep you know, a, a false charge against him of trying to rape another man's wife, and now he's in the pit. And then, all of a sudden, very quickly, see when Joseph is kind of rising from where he was, he was in the pit, and then from the pit, when he's coming out of there, it happens very quickly. 
God takes him from being nothing to becoming the prime minister of the biggest and the greatest nation in the world at that time, Egypt. That's what God is always doing. Things happen very quickly. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ was in obscurity, really relative obscurity, just like Joseph. And then same at the age of 30, he is taken by the Father and he is brought on the world stage. And he starts preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand. And John starts preaching and he tells everybody, here is the Lamb. You've been waiting for him and now he's here. Very suddenly and very quickly, Jesus is there. You know the kingdom of God has a king, King Jesus. King Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. And the Bible says when he is coming, when his kingdom comes, it will come suddenly and it will come quickly. Listen to the Lord speaking in Matthew chapter 24. It's quite amazing. Just like Noah's flood. Remember, Noah, you know, some people believe it took Noah a long, long time, many years, maybe even a hundred, over a hundred years to build the ark. But then, as soon as Noah and all the animals that he was told to bring were in the ark, then God shut the door of the ark, ark and then suddenly and quickly it started raining. Water came down from heaven, water came from under the earth, and there was a flood, and it happened very quickly. And listen to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. No one, he says, knows the day nor the hour. Not even the angels, not even the Son, but the Father only. But as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It will happen suddenly. It will happen quickly. You could be going in your car somewhere, you know, to the supermarket. Or you could be traveling to Nicosia, or to Larnka, or to Paphos, or Pasuri even. And it will all be over. Because God has already given us the warning. The warning is there. The warning is there that time is short. For as the days of Noah were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Then they were unaware. Meaning, people were going on with their lives and thinking it will never happen. You know what the, what the Bible is talking about, what this preacher is talking about, it's not going to happen really. And then, all of a sudden, quickly, it's going to happen. And then you will remember. You will remember all those things that you've heard. But then it will be too late. You don't want to be in a situation where it is too late, too late to repent, too late to turn from sins, and too late to run to Jesus. Because that's also going to happen. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. And you know, even for the church, it's going to be very sudden and very quick. Very amazing. Listen to the Apostle Paul. No, he's talking about the resurrection. Do you know that the dead are going to rise? The dead in Christ are going to rise. That's what the Bible focuses on, most of all. The dead in Christ are going to rise. And this is going to happen quickly. You know, Joseph was in the pit. And then before he knew it, he was charged. He was marched out of the, out of the pit. And very quickly he was shaved. He was given a wash. He was given new clothes. And then he came and stood right before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I am, I am at the dream, but there's nobody who can help me. But you, I heard, you can help. I tell you, says the Apostle Paul, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, 
nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is a secret, but it's no longer a secret. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You know when Jesus comes, it's going to happen Since suddenly. Is turned on, have it's going to happen suddenly. It's going to happen quickly. It's going to happen without any warning. You know when there are earthquakes, there are actually warnings. There are these uh, uh, Richter scales and there are these monitors that monitor activity under the earth and you know, the rumblings and, and, and the turns and, and, and the movement of, of ground underneath the water and they can kind of give you a warning that there's an earthquake coming, you know, be ready. Especially in the world where there are tsunamis, like Japan and places like that, you know, they get warnings that something is about to happen. When Jesus comes, this is the warning. Today is the day. Today is the day to heed that warning. And we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed hallelujah you know that's going to happen this this body is going to be changed the bible says and if i'm if i'm not alive when jesus returns it's going to happen that quickly it's going to get up from the ground in the twinkling of an eye And therefore, said Jesus, be ye ready. Amen. Be ready. And like those five virgins, wise virgins, they went to the marriage and they took oil with them to the marriage. Make sure you've got oil. Make sure you've got oil in your lamp. And you know what that oil is? It's the gospel. It's the grace of God in the gospel. It's Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit, salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins. All of those things are oil. And then thirdly, you think about how restful and content Joseph is. It doesn't matter where he is. I said, Marco, we learned so much from this man. When his brothers hated him, he is content. When he is sold by them, he is content with his lot. It's not a happy lot. It's not something he would have chosen. It's not something he would have wanted as a 17-year-old to be sold as a slave by your own brothers. <clears throat> but wherever Joseph went, God is with him. And he is with God. It's not just that God is with him, but he is with God. Joseph is seeking God wherever he is. He's in the pit. And the Bible tells us, and the Lord was with Joseph. God was with Joseph in the pit. And now he's standing before Pharaoh. And Joseph is free, no more chains. And Pharaoh says, I had a dream. Can you tell me what my dream is? And Joseph says, God will show you. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. <coughs> and when he did, he changed the name of Joseph. And he gave him the name in verse 45. And Pharaoh gave Joseph's name, Zaphanath Paniah. Nobody's really sure what it really means. But it could mean a revealer of secrets. Or it could also mean Savior of the world. Savior of the world. He's a picture of what Jesus is like. Joseph is a picture of Jesus. Joseph was innocent. Jesus was innocent. Joseph ended up in the prison between two prisoners. One was freed and the other was hanged. Just like Jesus ended up in the pit in a way. In a prison. 
in the cross, on the cross, and there were two men crucified with him, and one was free, one was given eternal life, and the other one was lost. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold by his brothers for 30 pieces of silver. And then Jesus was suddenly taken, suddenly. On the third day, you know, third day, Friday night, Jesus dies, Friday evening, Jesus dies on the cross, three o'clock, Saturday. And they bury him one day, Saturday, another day, third day, right very early in the morning, suddenly, Jesus is awake. He's risen from the dead, he's alive. Amen. And he's coming again. Today is Pentecost. Pentecost is a reminder. Pentecost, God is saying, get ready. I have given my spirit to the church. That means the last thing that I've said that's going to happen is about to happen. I'm coming again. Amen. Jesus is coming again. Today. And Joseph was the savior of the world. He's the prime minister and Joseph, Pharaoh says to him, I am Pharaoh, king of Egypt, but without you, no one will move their foot or do anything. If you say so, whatever you say, people will do. And then, while he was there, Joseph married him. Joseph was married to Pharaoh, gave him the priest daughter, Asana. And just before the famine came, in verse 50, we read, two sons were born to Joseph, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of the Onan. And Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, and the name of the second Ephraim. Manasseh, he said, for God has made me forget all the hardship and all my father's Maybe people have done something wrong to you. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe people have said bad things about you. Maybe you've been hurt in some way or another. And it's wrong to carry that hurt with you. Because that hurt will make you a bitter person. It will make you angry. It will change your character. You will become somebody that's irritable and unhappy to live with. And angry with yourself, and angry with everybody, and angry with God, and everybody evidently has. And the Bible teaches us to see that God is in control. That God allows certain things to happen in our lives, especially in the life of a Christian. That God has a purpose, and that purpose is ultimately to make us more like Jesus. And to be like Jesus... See, Jesus suffered as an innocent man. To be like Jesus, that means that we will also suffer. We will also be betrayed. We will also be gossiped against. And people will say bad things about us because of who we are. And sometimes things will happen to us that we don't like. And we don't want them to happen. But they will happen. But do what Joseph did. He remembered God. He says, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. And the name of the second one he called Ephraim. He says, God has made me fruitful. He made me forget all my misery and he has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So then, as we come to an end, what do we learn? Well, the first thing we learn is this, that in the Christian life, there is a lot of waiting involved. Waiting involved. We have to wait. When God answers, it will happen just like that. But until then, waiting is involved. Joseph waited 13 years. And after he interpreted the dream for the butler who was free, he said to him, remember me, and the man forgot about him. Can you imagine what would have happened if the man had remembered earlier? 
then Joseph would have missed the opportunity to have such an influence as he did over the whole world and especially over his family. That's what he said at the end of his life to his brothers. You know, you did this to me, but God took me to Egypt. It was God. You sold me, but it was God. <coughs> it was painful. <coughs> it was very painful. <laughs> of course it was. And Joseph probably cried many times. He may have cried when he remembered his father, when he remembered his family. But he looks back and says, it was God, it was God. God has put me there for you, for your survival. And ultimately for Jesus. That's why Joseph was in Egypt. It was for Jesus. So that this family of Israel, this family of Jacob would survive. And one day, hundreds of years later, a young woman called Mary will conceive and give birth to, to Jesus. Because of famine. You see, if Joseph was not in the right place at the right time, that whole family, the Jewish nation, would have perished. The long range view. Look at the long range view of your life and what God is doing and what God wants to do. And the second thing that you learn is do not forget God when you become successful. You see, one day he was in the pit and the next day he became prime minister. And the most Powerful, second most powerful man in the world is Joseph. And he's so young, he's only 30 years old. But you know what he didn't forget? God. God. He's a revealer of secrets. He's the savior of the world in a way. All the bread of the world is in his hands. And what does Joseph say? Ephraim and Manasseh. That's what he says. Manasseh and Ephraim, God has made me forget all the bitterness and all the anger and all the hurt. God has healed me. Joseph is a man whose broken heart has been healed by God. Manasseh and Ephraim, God has made me fruitful. Never forget. You see, it's dangerous when you, when you come to money. It's very dangerous. When you become rich, wealthy, maybe you've been poor most of the time, maybe you've been struggling, and then all of a sudden you make it, you become successful. Or you come to the top of your career, you've been working very hard, studying very hard, and then you become successful at the top, top of the ladder. Very dangerous time to be. Because that's when you can forget. God. You can forget reading your Bible then because it happens to people and they stop reading their Bibles and they stop having this time of prayer and communion every day with God and then they forget about the Lord's house. God's house. This is God's house, not just a building. This is God's house, my dear friend. And if you miss it, it's a very dangerous thing to do. Because you're walking on a dangerous and a slippery path where you can backslide. <coughs> and backsliding is so dangerous that you can go so far away from God. And stop praying. And become very weak as a Christian. And when you're weak as a Christian, then the devil is strong then. And the devil will get you very quickly and very easily and trip you up. And you could damage your whole life and your whole reputation and your whole Christian witness. And Joseph is now, he's so powerful, he's so wealthy. He's, he's, he's riding on a second chariot. Pharaoh's got his chariot and Joseph is on his second chariot. And wherever he's going, I mean, there's a whole bunch of soldiers right in front of him and telling everybody, bow the knee, bow the knee. And Joseph says, Manasseh. And Joseph says, if God, God, God. And then, thirdly, what do we learn? Character. What's your character like? 
you know, if you suddenly die, will people miss you? Character. Joseph has character. His character. And character, the secret of power, you see, he's very powerful. He's become very powerful. The secret of power, somebody has said, is character. And the secret of character is God. The more time you spend with God, the more time you earnestly seeking, you spend time seeking after God, the more time you spend in fellowship with God's people, it's going to change you. It's going to change you. It's going to make your character. And you're going to become a fruitful person, wherever you are. And when you're not there, people will miss you. <coughs> And you will make your mark. That's what Jesus said. You are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. Salt and light. You can't live without salt and light. You need salt and you need light. And that's what Christians are. And Pharaoh took note. Two qualities. He said, there is none so wise and discerning as you are. In whom is the Holy Spirit? First time the Holy Spirit is mentioned is mentioned through the lips of a man who is not a believer, Pharaoh. And he says, Joseph, no one has got the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, something very unusual was happening, that the Holy Spirit was coming upon individuals. On the day of Pentecost, what happened is, the Holy Spirit came on a whole company of people, 121 of them, Every one of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. The church came, was filled with the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, it was Gideon, Samson. It wasn't this hair, my dear friend. I'll cut my hair short. But Samson had long hair, uncut hair. It wasn't that. It was the Holy Spirit. Samson had the anointing of the Holy Spirit on him. That's where he was strong. Gideon became powerful and brave because of the Holy Spirit. David, David says, the Holy Spirit has spoken through me. Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, and, and Zechariah, and Obadiah, and everybody in, 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 in the Old Testament who spoke the word of God, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. My dear friend, you have the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, when people, when the famine came, just like Joseph said, <coughs> he was a true prophet of the Lord. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And when the famine came, there was no bread. And people cried to Pharaoh, and when in all the land of Egypt was famine, people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. Do what he tells you. You know when you're in trouble and there's famine? You know what famine is? When there's no bread. When there's no water. The Bible says, Go to Jesus. That's what you do. Go to Jesus. You know what Jesus says? He has plenty of everything. And the Bible says, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. And when you need bread, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And he who believes in me shall never hunger. And when you're thirsty, and when you're thirsty, what do you do? You do what the Holy Spirit says. Go to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? He who believes in me, he who believes in me, out of his innermost being, there shall be rivers of living water. I will give you the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, and the Holy Spirit will come and there will be a fountain of living waters inside you. 
Come to me, Jesus said. Come to me. All of you, all of you, me included, you, all of you, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And just like Joseph, but you know, the similarities are amazing, isn't it? Joseph is at the right hand of the Pharaoh. God is the Father, and God is the King of everything, the Lord of heaven and earth. That's what Jesus said. Father, thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. And at his right hand is Jesus. Hallelujah. At his right hand is Jesus. In charge of all the bread. Jesus is in charge of all the bread. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Have you ever asked Jesus to come to you, to come into your life, to forgive you, to save you? Do it today, do it today, do it now. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Save me, come into my heart. You are the bread I need. You are the fountain that I need. I need you. Call upon him. Amen. Let's pray. pray that you will teach us what Joseph learned, that it was God, it was always God, God at the center of his life, seeking after him, praying and spending time with him. May we do it all. May we be like Joseph in the world today. The world needs us. The world needs godly Christians, powerful Christians. Send us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. So we will sing our final song, which is um, we haven't actually sung it.